Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with our fourth lecture on protein synthesis inhibitors. A recap of our previous lecture as usual. The first question, which of these binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit and thereby inhibits translocation? Yes, the answer should be B, clethromycin, the macrolides, they bind to 50S ribosomal subunit and inhibit the translocation, which is the movement of the peptide chain from the A site back to the P site with the movement of the ribosome. Next question, which of these has a very long half-life due to the sequestration in the tissues? And it is only given once a day. Yes, the answer is azithromycin as we described the differences between the three macrolides erythromycin, clethromycin and azithromycin. Azithromycin is the one that has uh, the longest half-life. It is given once a day. It also has a large volume of distribution due to its being sequestered in the tissues and thereby having a long half-life. Yes, the drug used for the treatment of infection due to mycobacterium avium intracellular, that would be Calithromycin among the macrolides, um, clethromycin is preferred. The drug erythromycin is less preferred over the other macrolides, but in one condition it is preferred, and that is in the treatment of diphtheria. The answer would be D. Today's uh, lecture, the learning objectives, um, a brief note on fedaxomycin and telethromycin, the mechanism of action of, of clindamycin, its spectrum uses an adverse effects. So clindamycin is one of our um, protein synthesis inhibitors today. And the other major protein synthesis inhibitors, the group uh, tetracyclines. So we have to know the classification of tetracyclines, their mechanism of action, their spectrum uses adverse effects. And if we get time, we may also have some uh, note on chloramphenicol. So, um, fedaxomycin and telethromycin. Telethromycin is chemically similar to the macrolides. It is used in resistant cases to the macrolides, reason being less efflux by efflux pumps, so less chance of development of resistance to bacteria. Um, this is also causing a prolonged QT interval, just like the other macrolides. It is also hepatotoxic. Fedaxomycin is another newer uh, macrolide type. 
and it is used for the pseudomembranous colitis. If you remember from the principles of chemotherapy, what is a super infection? Yes, we have covered in um, general chemotherapy. A super infection is an infection over an earlier infection. It is caused by antibiotic treatment, mostly broad spectrum antibiotics. So, Fedaxomycin is being used for the treatment of pseudomembranous colitis caused by Clostridium difficile. Metronidazole is also one of the drugs used for this purpose. Clindamycin, the next protein synthesis inhibitors, it has um, the same mechanism of action as that of the macrolides. It also binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit and thereby inhibiting the translocation step. The spectrum, it is used, um, it is having antibacterial activity against gram-positive bacteria including streptococci, staphylococci, and pterococci, but its main use is for anaerobic bacteria, especially bacteroid fragilis and other anaerobes. So the uses of clindamycin for soft uh, tissue and skin infections, as we know, caused by staphylococci for endocarditis caused by gram-positive bacteria, especially in case of the patients who are allergic to penicillins, just like the macrolides are also used in patients who are allergic to penicillins for many conditions, especially involving uh, infections by gram-positive bacteria. Then a major use of clindamycin for anaerobic infections caused by bacteroids, um, dirty wounds of the gastrointestinal tract, and as well as the female genital tract, so pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, we are using clindamycin for female genital tract infections. <clears throat> the major adverse effect of clindamycin is that it causes pseudomembranous colitis. As we mentioned, fedaxomycin is used for the treatment of pseudomembranous colitis, but this drug, clindamycin, its uh, prominent adverse effect is that it is one of those that does cause pseudomembranous colitis, so uh, symptoms of diarrhea, nausea, and abdominal pain. The next group of protein synthesis inhibitors, the tetracyclines, although they are they were widely used in the past, but nowadays they are less used because of their adverse effects and because of resistance developed. They are broad spectrum antibiotics useful against a wide variety of uh, bacteria and they're also bacteriostatic like most other protein synthesis inhibitors. They only stop the growth of the bacteria, not kill. 
Until now, we have covered that the amino glycosides are bactericidal. Most of the others are bacteriostatic. So the classification of the tetracyclines, they are divided, classified based upon their duration of action. So we have uh, the short-acting tetracyclines, chlortetracycline, oxytetracycline, and tetracycline is also a generic uh, drug. Intermediate acting tetracyclines, we have demiclocycline and methacycline, and the longer, long acting tetracyclines, doxycycline, minocycline, and a related, chemically related drug, tegacycline. So, this is the small classification of the tetracyclines based upon the duration of action. Something about the kinetics of tetracycline. Their absorption is incomplete from the GIT and they are better absorbed when taken on an empty stomach. Reasons are due to uh, impaired absorption when given along with bivalent or trivalent cations. So for example, their absorption is impaired when given with dairy products like milk. Milk contains calcium. So if tetracyclines are given along with milk, the absorption of tetracyclines will be decreased. So the doctor should not advise the patient to take tetracyclines with milk as this will decrease their absorption. And likewise other dairy products as they also contain calcium. Similarly, other um, Drugs like antacids may contain bivalent uh, um, cations, magnesium salts, aluminium salts, and even calcium salts. <clears throat> Iron salts and zinc may also impair the absorption of tetracyclines. Bile acid binding resins, yes, where have we covered these drugs. The bile acid binding resins were covered in the topic of anti-dyslipidemic drugs. So the tetracycline absorption is also impaired when the bile acid binding resins are given. So it is best to take administer the tetracyclines on an empty stomach so that maximum absorption can take place. Um, next, the distribution, they are well distributed in the, into the tissues including the uh, breast and placenta, less into the CNS. Uh, they are excreted through the kidneys so one has to be careful in chronic renal disease, except for doxycycline and tigacycline, which are excreted through the bile. Next, the mechanism of action of tetracyclines. They have one similarity to the amino glycosides. They also bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit, their entry into the bacteria is also much similar to the amino glycosides. First of all, uh, passive diffusion through the outer membrane and then 
active transport into the inner membrane into the cytoplasm they bind to the 30s ribosomal subunit just like the amino glycosides here they prevent the binding of the transfer RNA to the corresponding messenger RNA. It may be due to uh, misalignment of the codons with the corresponding anticodons, meaning that the binding of the tetracyclines to the messenger RNA causes a certain change in the messenger RNA which causes this effect. So we have a small video. Several here. types of antibiotics inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. The 70S bacterial ribosome, which is composed of 30S and 50S subunits, is sufficiently different from the ADS ribosomes of eukaryotes to make it a target for selective toxicity. Most antibiotics bind either to the 30S or the 50S subunit of the ribosome, thereby interfering with protein synthesis. Aminoglycosides such as streptomycin bind to a protein in the 30S ribosomal subunit and interfere by inhibiting protein synthesis and causing misreading of the mRNA. Different aminoglycosides bind to different target proteins on the 30S ribosomal subunit. These antibiotics distort the ribosome so that misreading of the code in mRNA occurs and protein synthesis cannot continue. Bacteria can become resistant to aminoglycosides by mutation of the target ribosomal protein. The tetracyclines inhibit protein synthesis by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit and inhibiting the binding of aminoacyl tRNA to the A site. In contrast to streptomycin, they do not stop the ribosome on the mRNA but distort the ribosome so that the incoming aminoacyl tRNA can no longer bind properly to the A site. Bacteria become resistant to tetracyclines by developing an efflux mechanism that removes the tetracyclines from the cell. Some utilize a protein that binds to the ribosome and prevents binding of tetracyclines and some strains of bacteroides become resistant by chemically modifying the tetracycline so that it does not interfere with protein synthesis. Erythromycin, a macrolide antibiotic, binds to the 23... Another animation of the mechanism of action of tetracyclines has we can see the binding of the tetracyclines to the 30S ribosomal subunit causes a change so that the incoming transfer RNA cannot bind to the messenger RNA and therefore it stops the process of translation. In the video, the mechanisms of resistance to tetracyclines were also described. Number one, the efflux mechanism, a decrease influx modification of the target site, and an enzymatic inactivation of the tetracyclines. So basically all the four general mechanisms of resistance they also apply to the tetracyclines decreased uh, influx increase efflux modification of the target site which in this case is the 30s ribosomal subunit and an inactivation of the tetracyclines next the spectrum of tetracyclines 
uh, has mentioned they are less used nowadays but uh, due, due to their adverse effects but they still have some uses so um, rickettsia they are one of the drugs of choice for the treatment of rickettsial infections Clamdia, mycoplasma uh, vibrio cholera h pylori many of these as we mentioned are also the spectrum of yes also the spectrum of macrolides borella bragdoferi and neisseria gonorrhea brucella and Yersinia pestis and Francisella tolerances. All these three are also the spectrum of macrolides. So macrolides are preferred due to their less adverse effects. And Plasmodium falciparum is also a spectrum of the tetracyclines, especially doxycycline. So now we can um, enlist the uses of the tetracyclines based upon the spectrum that was just enlisted. As mentioned, they are the drugs of choice for rickettsial infections. These are a group of infections caused by rickettsia species, uh, ticks and other um, these, these are the pictures showing the different rickettsial infections and the ticks that are causing these rickettsial infections. <clears throat> this is, these are some other pictures. This is the scrub typhus. These are all uh, rickettsial infections caused by rickettsia. So we have epidemic typhus, marine scrub, and other types of typhus, Q fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. These are quite common in the Western countries. Then for mycoplasmic infections, for the treatment of mycoplasma pneumonia. For the treatment of clamdial infections, which cause three a major type of infections. Number one in the genital area, they cause genital disease and lymphogranoma venerum, that is by clamdia. And then in the eyes, clamdia trachomatis. And then in the lungs, clamdia pneumonia, clamdia bronchitis. So the tetracyclines may be used for the treatment of these um, three. Uh, major types of clamdial infections. Um, the macrolides, as we mentioned, are also used for the clamdial infections. <clears throat> for the treatment of gonorrhea caused by Neisseria. And then for the treatment of bacillary infections, that is brucellosis, tularemia, plague, and cholera. Brucellosis caused by brucella. Tularemia caused by Francisella tularensis. Plague caused by Yersinia pestis. And cholera caused by Vibrio cholera. Acne. Tetracyclines are one of the drugs prescribed for the treatment of acne. For the treatment of Lyme disease, which is shown here, caused by Borella bragdoferi, which was described in the spectrum. This is showing a picture of Lyme disease, again caused by certain ticks. For the treatment of malaria plasmodium, we have mentioned the use of doxycycline. Uh, this will again be uh, discussed in the chapter of anti-malarial drugs. For the eradication of H. pylori, 
just like clethromycin, just like other antibiotics like amoxicillin, we are also using tetracycline as an alternate in one of the regimes for the eradication of H. pylori, which is responsible for most cases of a peptic ulcer. For eradication of meningococcal infections, and the last use is a non chemotherapy use, a non chemotherapeutic use of tetracyclines is in the treatment of SIADH. Yes, anyone knows what is SIADH? <clears throat> Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Yes, so why is demiclocycline being used for this? First of all, you should be knowing what is diabetes insipidus. In diabetes insipidus, there is again polyuria and there is increased thirst, increased frequency of urination, but it's not diabetes mellitus, it is due to the decreased secretion or decreased function of ADH. So how does demicrocycline cause it? It causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in which the ADH receptors no longer respond to the circulating ADH hormone. So this leads to the decreased effects of ADH. This would be useful in a patient who is already having the excessive secretion of ADH, maybe from the pituitary or other causes of the inappropriate ADH secretion. So this is why demiclocycline, it was one of the drugs of choice for the treatment of SIADH in the past, but now it has been replaced by the ADH antagonists like Conivaptan, Tolvaptan. So the Vaptans have replaced this, but sometimes still Demiclocycline is used for the treatment of SIADH. This is a MTQ question as well. The non-chemotherapeutic use of tetracyclines. <clears throat> Now, the main reason why tetracyclines are rarely or less used nowadays is because of their wide variety of adverse effects. They do cause a yellowish discoloration of the teeth in children. This is why they are not recommended in children below the years of 8 to 12 years of age. And we can see a picture uh, called, this is a picture showing the a yellowish discoloration, one of the causes, or it may be that the child was given tetracyclines. So this, is, this has caused the permanent yellowish discoloration of the teeth. It is, uh, they are also hepatotoxic and phototoxic. Uh, this, is, this is the irritation to the skin upon exposure to sunlight. So we can get uh, this picture. Uh, this is phototoxicity. The person was exposed to sunlight and he was also taking the tetracycline. So this is a photosensitivity caused by the tetracyclines. 
one of the adverse effects that may be seen with administrance of these drugs. Other adverse effects, GIT, they do cause GIT disturbances, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They also cause pseudomembranous colitis caused by Clostridium difficile. So this is, as we mentioned, a super infection. Um, this is caused by Clostridium difficile. It is, as, as I mentioned, caused by broad spectrum antibiotics. These are also nephrotoxic. So besides being hepatotoxic, they are also nephrotoxic. And then hypersensitivity reactions, are, um, mild to moderate hypersensitivity reactions can be seen by the tetracyclines. Then thrombophlebitis upon uh, intravenous injections of some of these tetracyclines. Benign intracranial hypertension, BIH, one of the causes of benign intracranial hypertension is following the administration of tetracyclines. What happens in this case, there may be a headache, there may be vomiting, and there may be some neural disturbances like decreased sensations, weakness on one side of the body and other um, such disturbances. And this is caused by the tetracyclines. Minocycline may also cause vestibular disturbances leading to uh, dizziness, ataxia, and vomiting. They are contraindicated in pregnancy and also, as we mentioned, in children in young boys below the age of 8 to 12 years. Um, another important point, they should not be used when they are outdated. So expired tetracyclines beyond the due date should not be given as this may lead to Fanconi syndrome which mainly involves the kidney damage. This is one of the cause of Fanconi syndrome is um, expired tetracyclines. The next protein synthesis inhibitor is chloramphenicol. This again is rarely used nowadays. It was among the broad spectrum antibiotics, but nowadays rarely used because of its adverse effects. It is bacteriostatic, the mechanism of, of action. It binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit, just like the macrolides. And here it inhibits the peptide bond formation between the two amino acids. It inhibits the enzyme peptidyl transferase. So it blocks the steps of protein synthesis at this stage. So we have another video here. We can see the chloramphenicol binding to the 50S ribosomal subunit. And the site where it acts over here 
it blocks the peptide chain elongation and therefore blocking the further protein synthesis. So as we mentioned it is rarely used. There are many other drugs now used for the treatment of typhoid fever. It may be useful in a very resistant case of typhoid fever caused by salmonella typhi. Uh, we're not going into the spectrum because as I mentioned it is rarely used nowadays. So the only few uses in which it is still uh, sometimes used for bacterial meningitis again resistant cases has an alternate to the third generation cephalosporines we uh, may use chloramphenicol anaerobic infections again a rare use for serious intra-abdominal infections or brain abscess again this is for resistant cases Rickettsial infections, tetracyclines are the first choice as we mentioned. So the macrolides may also be given. Chloramphenicol are a far third choice for the treatment of rickettsial infections which were discussed. For the treatment of brucellosis, again tetracyclines and macrolides are preferred. Uh, especially the macrolides, chloramphenicol is an alternate. So the major point which is asked about chloramphenicol is about its adverse effects. The major adverse effect is um, bone marrow suppression so severe that it may lead to aplastic anemia which is leading to pancytopenia which means there, there may be anemia, there may be neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. There are two mechanisms of this bone marrow suppression. One of them is dose dependent meaning in higher doses chloramphenicol may cause uh, bone marrow suppression but the second is idiopathic which means that even in therapeutic doses it may cause bone marrow suppression <clears throat> this is why it is um, now rarely used because of this um, severe or serious adverse effect It may also cause hypersensitivity reactions like many other antibiotics. Uh, GIT, nausea, vomiting, unpleasant taste, GIT disturbances, diarrhea. And in the neonates, it may cause the gray baby syndrome. As we discussed in general pharmacology, the neonates have a immature enzyme system. They have decreased activity of the enzyme glucuronide transferase. This is a phase one or phase two metabolic enzyme. Yes, it is phase two glucuronide conjugation. So due to the deficiency of this enzyme in the newborn and early childbirth after after the birth they are unable to metabolize drugs like chloramphenicol this leads to the accumulation of chloramphenicol in the body and this leads to the symptoms which were discussed of the gray baby syndrome including cyanosis causing that grayish color of the baby. So this is the reason, the second reason. In infants not used because of the chance of development of gray baby syndrome and in adults not used because of the high chance of the bone marrow suppression. So this is a 
the reason why it is rarely used. Again, there are also some drug interactions with chloramphenicol. It does cause enzyme inhibition, one of the <clears throat> enzyme inhibitors. So if other drugs are given along with chloramphenicol, it may cause their toxicity because by inhibiting their metabolism, it will increase their concentration. So for example, warfarin, phenytoin, chlorpropamide, and especially warfarin toxicity may be dangerous as it is a drug which has a low therapeutic index. On the other side, enzyme inducers like phenobarbitone, rifampin, may increase the metabolism of chloramphenicol and thereby decrease its plasma concentration in the body and decrease its effectiveness. So with this, we end with today's discussion on the um, other group of protein synthesis inhibitors. We have gone through some of the macrolide-like antibiotics, telethromycin and fedaxomycin. We have gone through clindamycin, one of the drugs used for the treatment of mainly anaerobic bacteria like bacteroids. If you remember, some second generation cephalosporines are also used for uh, bacteroid fragilis uh, infections. <clears throat> then we went on to discuss uh, the tetracyclines, a major group of protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, but their adverse effects limit their use. We describe their mechanism of action, spectrum, and adverse effects. Hepatotoxic, nephrotoxicity, the yellowish discoloration of the teeth, phototoxicity, GIT disturbances, benign intracranial hypertension. Although they have some very useful very useful um, conditions in like rickettsial infections. They are the drugs of choice. And for the Lyme disease, for some um, infections caused by bacilli, for malaria like doxycycline and other uses. And then last of all, we discussed uh, chloramphenicol, a drug which is also now rarely used because of its main adverse effect in adults causing um, bone marrow suppression, aplastic anemia due to uh, dose dependent and idiopathic causes. Um, it is really used for some conditions and it is also causing the gray baby syndrome in the newborns. So this ends the fourth lecture on the protein synthesis inhibitors. We are left with one remaining lecture on this topic of protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, if you have, again, any questions, you can contact me. Thank you very much.